Uh, I hope everyone's long weekend was good. Y'all got some break. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a reminder since I guess it's been a week uh, since the last lecture. Um, so let's just remember what the task is in survey, um, survey, um, survey opinion collection. Um, each person has some opinion, and what you care about is the mean opinion across the population. Uh, for each person, you also have access to some of their covariates, so things like maybe education or ethnicity or gender or whatever. And um, yeah, so we care about the mean population estimate. Sometimes we also care about the conditional means. And then last time we said that there could be two things that can go wrong, at least. Um, the first one is that um, sort of someone responds to the survey, but they don't respond with their true opinion. So they give you some opinion other than their true opinion. And then, of course, unless these um, errors cancel out, you're not going to um, recover the mean opinion. OK, so the other thing that can go wrong, and that's going to be the focus of today's lecture, so sort of these slides are the same as last time, so I'm just going to quickly go through them. So, so the other thing that can go wrong, of course, is that um, a sort of selection bias or differential non-response, whatever you want to call it, is that the people who respond to your survey are not actually the population that you care about. And so one way we can formalize that is each person has um, some tendency to respond, some probability at which they respond, and then be, um, if that tendency is correlated with opinions, so someone is both less likely to respond and um, sort of tends to have a certain opinion, then you're of course, um, then you're also um, not going to recover the true opinion. And in this lecture, we're going to uh, try to look at weighting techniques to solve the second challenge. Are there any questions before we get started? OK, cool. Um, OK, so, so the plan today is uh, various methods to tackle sample representation issues. Um, we're going to start with um, what's called stratification, which is what things that you can do um, even before you like call anyone. So how can you uh, maybe change who you're going to call in order to take care of some of these representation issues? And this is going to be mostly a warm up to um, methods that you can do after um, you have the people that you respond with. So weighting techniques after you have responses. And the bulk of the homework is actually, uh, or the bulk of the programming part of the homework is actually sort of going to be covered there, is going to be covered in this part of the lecture. OK. So let's, uh, OK. So yeah, so here's the outline. Um, but let's dive into the problem a little bit more, which is uh, we're only going to cover uh, here differential response on known covariates. So on, next time, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens if people are not responding uh, in terms of a covariate that you don't observe. Um, so for example, if just, um, for example, there's a hypothesis that this happened in the last election that people sort of who have less social trust or something along those lines are less likely to respond polls, but those people are also more likely to um, vote for uh, vote for Trump. And you know, social trust is something that you can't observe in the data. You can't ask someone about, and so um, sort of it, it's hard to fix. But today we're going to talk about differential response on known covariates, which is something like gender, or ethnicity, or education, which you can plausibly get for each person. And that's the thing that people are not responding on. OK, so just to formalize a little bit, suppose that we have a, bi a binary covariate. Uh, I'm going to label that xj. And for this example, let's just say that this indicates whether they graduated from college. Um, basically, everything I'm going to do today generalizes to how many, like, you know, you can, you can do this in continuous covariates, you can do this in non binary. But um, for today, I'm just going to simplify it to binary. OK. And you know, for the sake of this example, let's say that half the population went to college. And now, of course, suppose that whether people answered is correlated with education. And so I'm going to um, sort of denote that here. 
is that the probability that uh, someone responded is 0.1 if um, sort of xj is zero, so they didn't go to college, or it's 0.4 if um, they did go to college. Now, of course, you know, these might seem low, but if you all remember from either the last lecture or the lecture before, um, this is quite high in survey responses today. Um, sort of nowadays, response rates are in like the low single digits. Um, for the sake of this example, okay. So, so the question was, are we assuming that went to college means graduated from college? So, so that's definitely a great question in that um, oftentimes um, in polling, you have to be very careful on like how you define these terms, how you aggregate them, how people interpret these terms and like what the data that you have says. Um, for the sake of this example, it doesn't matter. Um, we, but yes, yeah, so, so oftentimes in polling, and I think you'll see this in the homework too, they do distinguish between some college and graduated college. Okay, and let's say that education is also correlated with true opinion. And we want to measure the population mean. So basically this is the same thing as last time, except now that we're um, sort of, we're, we're specifying that, um, X, that XJ is education, and this is what the differential opinion and the non-response is. Now, the key assumption that we're gonna make in all of our techniques is the following, is that there's no other correlations between whether people answer and the opinion. So we have some covariate XJ, and that basically describes all of the differential non-response. So, um, uh, another way to say that, maybe slightly more formally, is that the opinion is independent of whether they respond after you condition on XJ. So this is not true before you look at education, but after you look at education, sort of let's say within XJ equals one, within everyone who went to college, um, there's sort of there's there's no difference in response rates um, between uh, YJ equals one or YJ equals zero. And within people who didn't go to college, there's no difference in response rates. This is the key assumption that we have to make. Any questions about that? And it turns out that if you make this assumption, um, now, you know, of course, XJ can, and we're gonna talk about this later on in the lecture, if you make this, that you know, XJ can not just be education, it can be education, gender, ethnicity, sort of you can go as deep as you want, um, but we need an assumption like this, that conditional, that once you have these covariates that you're conditioning on, that you observe, um, that explains away all the selection bias. Okay, any questions about that? Um, no, not exactly. So, so, so the question was, um, am I saying that within the people who went to college, is the opinion not correlated with whether they went to college? No, so I'm not saying that. Because we do know that the opinion is correlated with whether they went to college or not. What I'm saying is, within the people who went to college, whether they respond is not correlated with their opinion. So, um, so within the people who went to college, um, whether I pick up or the, whether I pick up the phone or not, or an answer is not correlated with my support for Trump. And within the people who didn't go to college, my um, my support for Trump is not correlated with um, whether I pick up the phone. Does that clarify? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna introduce some new notation that's gonna simplify some of the math on these slides. Um, just as a reminder, um, like I, I am gonna go through math on the slides. In this room, it, it's a little hard to sort of maybe do stuff on the iPad. I might try that eventually, but um, I recognize that math on the slides is not ideal. Um, that's why sort of all the lecture slides are posted um, online, and so 
um, hopefully this will work. If this you know doesn't work, please let me know, and I'll try a bit harder to like do stuff on the iPad and write down in future lectures. Okay. So new notation, um, or some of this might be old notation, but just as a reminder. So n is going to be the number of people that I call, not the number of people I, that answer, but the number of people I call. A, L, okay, so, so I'm gonna, L is gonna denote the group. And oftentimes I'm gonna be like, you know, L equals zero denoting X, J equals zero. And so L is just gonna denote like, you know, the, what, what the value of the covariate is. So for example, we have group zero and group one. And let's say AL is the population response rate for group zero. So that's the true response rate I showed on the previous slide. Um, y bar L is the mean response rate in the population, mean response in the, in the population for that group. And uppercase PL is the sort of the fraction of the population um, that is of that group. So um, from the last slide, AL is 0.1 and 0.4 for the two groups respectively. Um, YL, I don't think I specified. And then PL is um, 0.5 for each group. And then let's say the corresponding values for the people that I actually call are A hat, Y hat, and P, um, P hat. And so sort of just to specify a little bit more in the pre, like, what this means in the previous notation is, so this right-hand side is, remember it's the number, it's sort of this internal thing is the set of people such that the response, so they did respond, so AJ equals one, and that they belong in group L, right? So this is the set, and then these bars mean the size of that set. And so the number of people who responded that were in group L is equal to, the number of people that I called overall times the fraction of the people that I called that were in group L times the fraction times the fraction that I called that actually responded. Sort of is, is that clear to everyone why why this is true? And so so notice that there's two sources of randomness here. The first sort um, source of randomness is that the fraction of people that you know I pulled out of a phone book might actually not match the population um, overall. And then the fraction of people that respond may not match the sort of like if I called a billion people, how many how many of them would have responded? Okay. And sort of just to clarify a bit more, then the true opinion that I care about is, so, so, so the denominator is just one because I have two groups, so their population fractions add up to one. Um, my true opinion is just the fraction of the population that has opinion of group zero and fraction of the population that has the mean opinion of group one. But um, sort of if I just do a naive, I call everyone and I just you know, average the example, average the responses that they have, I'm gonna get the following, I'm gonna get um, sort of the, so this is group zero. So this is, um, this is the frac, this is the fraction of people that I call that belong to group zero. And then, uh, a time, a hat times p hat is the fraction is sort of, is how many of them actually responded. And then y hat is their mean opinion, right? So, so this is, this, this entire term is proportional to Oh, sorry, sorry. A, a hat times p hat is proportional to the fraction of people that I responded, or fraction of people that I responded that belong to group zero. And then y hat zero is just their mean opinion. And then I add this to the other sort of group one, and then I just normalize by the, by the number of people who responded, or the fraction of people who responded. Any questions here on why this is the naive method? And so in our example, um, we're gonna have, you know, the, the truth is that um, half the population is group zero. And so the truth is half of them, 
have that, have that opinion on average and then half of the other opinion on average. But if you go back to the previous slide, you'll see that the response rate for one group was one fourth the response rate for the other group. And so, and because population, because the sort of the population fractions are the same, the sort of, if you just do the naive method, you're gonna get a lot more people in group one and you're averaging. And so if group one has a different opinion than group zero on average, then you're, you're gonna be wrong even if you call a billion people. Any questions here? Okay. Okay, so let, let, let's sort of, I, I just really wanna make sure that sort of everyone understands what the naive method is doing because all of the, the solutions are, are sort of gonna depend on understanding the naive method. So let's dig in a little bit more. So what, what is the naive method doing? It's, um, so, so the denominator here is the number of total number of respondents, right? So this is the number of respondents, who, the, the first part is the number of respondents of group zero, the second part is the number of respondents from group one. And then the numerator is just the number of people who respond from group zero who respond positively, who respond yj equals one, plus the same from group one. Yeah, so, so this is, you know, um, sort of, I, I can write it down in the notation from the previous slide, and I'm just gonna start using this notation. I'm, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, as much as possible, ignore the summation notation. Okay, and like I said from last slide, this sort of this value, um, a hat times p hat times y hat converges to this population value, which is the fraction of the group that's of that population times the fraction that tends to respond times the mean opinion, plus that for the other group and then normalized. And this does not equal the thing that we care about, even if we sample a billion people, unless um, you have the same response, response rates for each group. And so this is what's called bias. So in um, machine learning classes, you might sort of distinguish between bias and variance. Um, that's fine if you haven't covered that, I'll dig in a little bit more in a second. But this is what's called bias, right? Is even if I had, even if I called as many people as I wanted, I'm never gonna get the right answer unless the response rates are the same. And then, and so that's, um, that's bias, which is the limit fraction does not match the population fraction. Um, but then we, we also have variance here, which is um, this, uh, this is the actual value that I have, right? Which is the actual people that I called. And we'll see that, so what variance is, is that the sample values do not match the limit values. So here there's two sources of variance. Oh, I, I mixed the order, but one is the, the response rates of the people I call may not match the response rates of the population if I called a bunch more people. Right, so A hat can, may not be A. And then P hat may not be P in which, you know, if I just randomly sampled from the phone book, if I just randomly sampled 100 people, maybe I didn't exactly sample 50 people fr um, from group zero and 50 people from group one, right? Maybe out of pure randomness, I did 60, 40, or 55, 45, or whatever, right? So that, that's variance, is that um, sort of the who I called may not exactly match the population fraction. And that's, of course, gonna happen unless I, and this is what I'm gonna talk about next, is unless you make sure that that doesn't happen, right? That you actually match the population fractions on who you're calling. Okay, any questions? Um, so the question was, is we're only considering the people with opinions yj equals one. And um, not exactly, I mean, it's just, um, th that's how we just get the average, right? So um, the sort of, 
I'm summing over every opinion here, whether or not yj equals one or zero, but you can ha add as many zeros as you, as you want and it's still gonna be zero. And so the numerator, so like, and, 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 but then in the denominator, the people with opinion zero are included, right? In the denominator, I'm not restricting you to have opinion one. I'm restricting you to have responded. So aj equals one means that you like picked up and responded to the poll but I'm not restricting you to actually have responded whatever response one means that you support Trump or Clinton or Biden or whoever. Aren't you trying to find like the population fraction? So how do you know that the population fraction? Like what's the population fraction that you want to know the population fraction of the population fraction? Ah, great question. So the question was is, um, how are we um, going to know that we have variants if we don't know the population fraction in advance. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit, is oftentimes you do know the population fraction. So from census data, you know roughly the ethnicity sort of breakdown of the state um, or the education breakdown or whatever. Now what's harder, and um, I'm not sure I actually asked you to do this in the homework, I don't remember, but um, like a big challenge in practice is pollsters don't know who's gonna vote, right? The population that you care about in practice is the people who are gonna turn out on election day, but you don't know that. And so a big part of um, polling and sort of this explains a lot of differences between pollsters is who they think is going to vote, is gonna actually turn out to vote and what they deem as their population fraction. Uh, I'm, gonna talk a bit, I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in a little bit actually. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so let's do the first attempt at try to fix this. Also, have these captions been pretty good? I haven't been looking at them. Okay. Some people said yes, some people did this, okay. Um, we'll keep them for now. I'm happy to remove them if they're distracting. Um, but, you know, or if, you know, if you find them helpful, please let me know and I'll definitely keep them. Okay. Okay, so what is stratified sampling? Um, the main idea is um, you know that there's going to be maybe differential non-response or that the, the, the people that you call does not match the, um, sort of the population fractions. And so you just change who you call in order so, such that the people who respond do match the fraction that you care about. And so let's suppose that you have a bunch of mutually exclusive demographic groups. And so uppercase L is the number. And this, I'm just now repeating the assumption that I made earlier. So the population can differ across groups in the sense that you know, response rates conditional on education equals zero and education equals one uh, could correlate with opinion. But the key assumption is that they're relatively homogenous within groups. And by that, I mean exactly the assumption that I made earlier, which is conditional on your group, whether you respond is independent of your opinion. And so let's suppose that we have this setup. And this is, this is again, the setup throughout the entire lecture. Okay, now instead of calling n completely random people, stratified sampling is very simple. Instead, I just call some number n, um, nl from each group. So I just fix the number of people from each group that I call. Where nl is now determined by how likely each group is to respond as well as the population fraction. And why do I do this? Um, again, I'll dive in deeper in the next slide, but sort of at a high level, is even if each group has the same response rate, this is gonna decrease variance. But perhaps more importantly, if different groups have differential response rates, then this is also corrects the bias in your estimate. Okay, 
So um, let's just walk through that maybe in the math a little bit more. So even if you don't have different, different response rates, just different opinions, recall that there's two sources of variance in the estimation that I pointed out earlier. The, the first sort of variance is whether people, whether one group is over or under sampled in the, the set of people who I respond. So maybe, you know, I, I, I picked the phone group and I accidentally got 55 from one group and 45 from the other. Or even if, if I called a billion people, they had the same response rates. Because I only called 100 people, um, the response rates you know, are 60 for one group, 40 for the other, or 45 for the other, or so on. So that could be one, one source of variance. Um, the other source of variance, of course, is what the opinion of each person is, right? Is um, not exactly like, like the, the set of people that I call and respond are not going to be exactly representative of um, sort of the population. And stratification mitigates this first sort of variance because it makes sure that, or it tries to make sure that um, out of the people that I call and hopefully that I respond, the um, sort of exactly match the population that I care about. And if there's also a differential response rate, so if one group is you know, responding with frequency 0.1, the other with 0.4, you can just try to cancel out that out by just calling more people from that group. Right? So if you just, if one group four times fewer people respond, just call four times more people, and that'll cancel itself out. OK. And sort of why, OK, so this is what's going on is, the denominator earlier, uh, remember, was the number of people I called overall, time uh, for each group, so the, like this part, is the number of people I called overall times the fraction that I called that belonged to that group times the fraction that responded. And so now I just replace this first n times p hat with nl, right? So I, so I, re um, I just made that exact. And then, so now um, the number of people who respond or the people that I call times just the response rate. And then this is the same as last time. And then this is going to converge to um, sort of, again, I just replace n times p with n0 and n1. And this is actually exactly what we want if I happen to cancel, if I set n exactly, right? So if I if I set n in a way that cancels out the response rate and is proportional to the population percentage, um, then I'm good. And so with stratification, you're canceling out the bias because you simply asked more people from the group with their lower response rate. And you're also reducing variance because instead of it being random how many people from each group that you called, you're just fixing that in advance. Does this make sense? And the weighting techniques, which we're going to talk about next, are really just trying to mimic um, this first part. And just after you get the responses, they're going to be trying to weight people such that like in your averaging, you have like the same weight from each group. And so one way to think about the techniques I'll talk about next is that if you didn't stratify ahead of time, you try to like uh, um, sort of work with your data, massage your data such that you get at least the bias correction uh, benefits uh, afterward. Any questions here? OK, so like this seems easy. You just like, you know, when you like are asking for opinions in your product or whatever, just like make sure the groups balance out and then you're done, right? Like why, why am I going to cover weighting techniques in so much detail? Um, in practice, it's often very hard to do this. Um, the sort of 
first reason might be that you just don't know the group response rates until you start calling people, right? Like, like you might know that um, sort of people who didn't go to college will tend to have a smaller response rate than people who do, but you don't know the exact number you, or you don't know the exact like relationship. Um, so one way to solve that is, okay, maybe you don't have a fixed number for each group that you call, but you just have a fixed number of responses you're going for. So you just keep your survey going until you get a fixed, fixed number of people who respond from each group. Um, or you can do waiting after the sample, which is what I'm going to talk about next. OK, so what's the other challenge? And this is also going to be a challenge in waiting, which is how many groups do you choose and what groups do you choose? So in the example that I walked through so far, we just had a single binary covariate that we called education for whatever reason. But why stop there, right? Why, why not use ethnicity or ethnicity and gender or ethnicity and gender and education, right? Like, like why can't you define smaller and smaller intersectional groups such that you're guaranteed, or not guaranteed, but that you, you're more and more confident that um, sort of the assumption is met, that within each very small intersectional group, the response rates are not correlated with opinion. Right, like why not just do that? Um, so one challenge, and again, I'm gonna talk about this a lot more detail in waiting, is one challenge is as the number of groups increase, the number of people in each group decreases. And sort of that causes a whole lot of problems that I'll talk about next, but you know, um, uh, yeah, actually that's all I'll say here. But yeah, so sort of stepping back, what you want to do, is if you're going to try to do stratification, sort of you need to strike this balance of um, you don't want too specific of a group because that has all these challenges, like exactly balance in practice, but you want a specific enough group such that your response is not correlated with whether they respond within each group. Any questions on stratification? Okay, so now let's turn our attention to, so okay, so, so stratification was before I call people, I change who I'm going to call, and hopefully that balances out my groups. Waiting is, okay, I called a bunch of people, and maybe I stratified, maybe I didn't, but at the end of the day, I have a fixed, you know, I have the responses that I have, I have, and instead of just naively taking the mean, can I do something else in order to solve the challenges that I talked about earlier? Yeah, so, so waiting is just trying to mimic the benefits of stratification, but doing it after you've already called people. And I, I kind of talked about this just in a few slides, but maybe to reiterate, so there's a bunch of reasons you might wanna do this. The first one is you don't know the response rates per group, or maybe you stratified with, with an assumption on some response rates, but the response rates ended up differing from your assumptions. Another just practical challenge is, is you might not know someone's demographics until you call them, right? Like in your poll, your first 10 questions are gonna be, uh, what's your gender, ethnicity, education, and so on. And you might not, like, like the phone book doesn't necessarily have all that information for each person. And so you, like, you might just not be able to stratify. Um, another benefit that I'm really gonna talk about next week, or today's Wednesday, yeah, next week, is um, you can, um, with waiting, you can sort of try to think about counterfactuals and a little bit more, which is what would my estimate be if I sort of, if my likely, if sort of, if my likely voters look like this? Or what would my estimate be if, you know, 5% more of the population belonged to this group than before? 
right? So you can th uh, you can do weighting to construct what are different counterfactuals of my population opinion if my population is changing. And in the voting context, of course, the population is changing, right? Is even that's on like that's somewhat under well one noise, but also under your control as a campaign is you can determine is you can try to change who votes. And um, weighting can often sort of fix the bias in that you um, sort of, if you, if you do it right, you can try to cancel the bias, but what it doesn't have is the same variance reduction properties of stratification. Because the variance reduction properties of weighting of stratification came from because you called exactly the right number from each group. Maybe they responded differently, but at least you called the right number. Here with weighting, um, you can't go back and call the right number from each group. You can just say that one person, like someone from one group, is more important in your averaging than than someone from another group. So it doesn't have the same variance reduction properties. Okay. So what's the main idea on how to do weighting? Um, there's two steps. And then the exact techniques I'm going to talk about for the rest of today are just different in what these two steps look like. The first step might be so obvious that like I shouldn't even work, like I shouldn't even like write it down. Um, it is you want to use the responses that you have to estimate the mean opinion for each group separately. Right? So you want to get some estimate y hat of L for group L. And then you just do a weighted average of YL to get your final estimate. And you give each group some weight WL. Right, so your overall estimate is just the weighted sum. And um, then your hope is that if your weights match your population fractions and your estimates y hat with enough samples um, sort of converge to the opinion for that group, then your overall estimate is going to converge to the thing that you care about. Every technique I'm going to talk about today is just variations on these two steps. Um, there are some techniques that are um, sort of not exactly variations of this, but they're like, you know, um, trying to get at approximately the same thing. Maybe they do weighting at the individual level instead of the group level, but um, similar ideas. Are there any questions about the two steps? Okay, so, so the question is, is in what circumstances would you weigh to stratified sample? Um, so, I mean, you might want to almost always do it. So, like, the, the stratification is trying to sort of fix the issues that you knew beforehand. So, you know that one group is less likely to respond. And so, you know, you just call more for that group. Um, waiting is try to fi trying to fix issues that you couldn't fix beforehand. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, and so the details and the different methods are going to differ in how to construct this estimate y out of L, how to calculate the weights w of L, and what groups to even consider. OK, so let's do, just so everyone understands these two steps, let's talk about the naive um, the most naive weighting technique and how those that works in the two steps. So step one is just use the mean response for each group separately, right? So this is, I'm just considering everyone, uh, uh, I think I'm trying to keep on this screen because the video captures this screen, um, except the, the laser pointer might not show up on the screen very well. 
Oh yeah, because the video is capturing the very bottom of the screen. Okay, so that's useless. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, yeah. So so step one for each group, you um, you just calculate the mean response for that group. You just ignore every other group and you say amongst the people who went to college, what was the mean response? And then step two is you just use the best guess that you have of the population fraction, right? So from census data, you might know that 50% of the US went to college, 50% of the state went to college or the county, or you know, from um, profiles you've done of your company's users, you know that 60% of your company's users are women or so on, right? So you just use your best guess for the population fraction. Okay, so the, so the immediate complication um, is how many groups do you choose and which ones, right? It's the same issue that we had in stratification, but now I'm gonna talk about the problems in a bit more detail. So let's say that you choose way too broad of a group, right? So um, in the US often, you know, you can choose like political opinions often differ by gender on average, but it's unclear that just, just after you look at gender that you've like fixed your cardinal rule, right? It's unclear whether just conditioning on gender, you, that the, the mean opinion is independent of whether they respond, right? Because, you know, for example, response rates and opinions are correlated with education and gender is not perfectly a proxy for education, right? So if you choose too broad of a group, you're not gonna actually get the benefits of weighting. Is that a question or just stretching? Yes. Okay. Um, so just to repeat the question. So the question was in stratification, you just, you, you look at um, sort of, you, you try to predict the response rates and then you try to adjust for that. Yeah, so, so that is one use of stratification. But as I talked about, even if the response rates are exactly the same for each group, you might still want to stratify just because um, then you know that you'll call exactly the right number from each group. Okay. Um, okay. So back to uh, any other questions before I move on. Okay. So yeah. So if you have too broad of a group, then you're like your weighting didn't actually do anything, right? Because the assumption that you made, which is conditional on what you weight, um, the response is independent of whether they respond. Um, that doesn't hold. Okay, but let's do that you do too specific of a group. Then now you have two issues. Now you have two challenges. One is that your estimate might be really bad, right? So the first step was I just took the mean of everyone in that group. But if my group is defined as like an intersectional thing of 10 covariates, then I might only have one person in that group. And then my entire estimate for that group is going to depend on that one person. So I, so I forget if it's in the suggested readings for this week or for next time. But um, there, there was sort of a famous example from a tracking poll in 2016. That, so, so the way tracking polls work is they, um, they, fix, their popu they, they fix their sample beforehand. So they, they fix, I'm going to call these 1,000 people beforehand. And then they call the same thousand people. Um, they might pay them. They, they call that those same set of people every week um, for the entire election period. And so the idea for that tracking poll is they want to, like, you know, try to really look at changes over time amongst the same people. And so there was a famous case in 2016 where there was a tracking poll that happened to um, just have um, 
one black man between the ages of 18 to 25 in their entire sample. And, and then they, of course, did waiting. Um, and whether, sort of, whether or not that person responded and, or whether or not what that person said, their overall, even though that, that person was one person out of like a thousand people they called, their entire estimate would shift like one or two points, depending on just one person's response. And that's exactly this first issue. Is that, I mean, they didn't even go for that specific of a group, but because sort of that person was all they had for that group, their estimates for that group were just bad or sort of were very dependent on that. Not bad, just very dependent on one person. OK, and then the second problem is what if you just don't know the population fraction, right? So what if you don't know what percentage of the population is you know, this, this intersectional thing or this, this thing alongside five other covariates? Um, so the question is, is um, why did those pollsters not employ stratification? Um, they might have, I don't know. Um, but it, it might just, they, they might have just gotten unlucky, right? So they might just, they might have stratified and, or they might have, you know, yeah, they might just gotten unlucky with one group. And what though, like sort of because those polls are really trying to like gauge opinion changes over time, um, they can't, or, okay, so stepping back. Another thing with polling and, you know, a lot of good science is you want to, like, pre-register your methods, right? You want to say, this is what I'm going to do, and then you want to do exactly those methods. Now, like, in hindsight, you might have realized that those methods were bad, but you should, you still try to keep those methods because, like, otherwise, um, sort of, you might be susceptible to p-hacking or you might just be, like, susceptible to, like, your methods changing because of what you see. And so they had some method for how they're going to stratify and like determine their initial universe of people they're going to call. And then for whatever reason, they got unlucky. And so they had a choice to make. They could either just, you know, that was the method they said they would do, and so they're going to do it. Or they could try to go back and change their methods. And they chose, you know, you know they're, they're not dumb people. They knew they, this was an issue, but they were following the methods that they said they would. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, so, so problem two is you might not know the population fraction. Okay, so let's talk about problem two first. Um, this is gonna be a bunch of the homework. So suppose you have a very specific group. Then the naive method says, let me try to get the best, let me try to figure out what the true population percentage of this group is. Right, so for example, if L is the fraction, if L is college educated white women age 35 to 44, then you need to know exactly the population, the fraction of the population that belongs to that group. Now, maybe you have this, or, and by that group, I mean the fraction of the population that's going to vote that belongs to this group. Now, maybe you have a decent estimate of this, maybe you don't, but this is something that's like not terribly easy to get. Okay, so what's easier? Suppose you had, so from the census, it's easy to figure out, um, relatively easier to figure out approximately what's the fraction of the population that's a woman? What's the fraction of the population that's college educated, that's white, that's of this age group? And then pretend that all of these things are, um, on, that sort of are independent, right? So pretend that whether you're white does not correlate, and whether your your age and your race, your ethnicity or race doesn't correlate with whether you're college educated. Um, pretend that gender doesn't correlate with these things either. Now, of course, we know that's not true, but that's one assumption you can make, right? Just pretend that the fraction of that group is the fraction implied by the marginal distributions if you just multiply all the way out. 
And so this is so in the homework, what we're gonna have you do is we're gonna give you the joint distributions for Florida for just two covariates, because we didn't have access to five covariates. So we're gonna give you joint distributions for two covariates. And then we're gonna ask you to compare the estimates you get from that to the estimates you get from looking at the marginal distributions. Um, there's, there's another thing that you can do that's often the thing done in practice. I'm not gonna cover it here, um, but sort of the, the, there's, there's a bonus part of the homework that you know, invites you to try to like use some Python packages or like try to understand raking and then um, use it. But sort of what I'll just stay with here is the high level idea is you want to match the marginal distributions for the for across like 10 covariates. So you want to make sure that your weights have the right number of women, the right number of college educated people, and so on, without making this assumption that each that sort of the likelihood of each group is just the product of the marginals. Right. So it, it tries to do somewhere in between these two methods where you don't actually have access to the joint distribution for each group, but you're not gonna go so far as to assume that they're independent. I'm happy to talk about this method more in like office hours or afterward, but that's all I'm gonna say here. Okay, any other questions on problem two and like various ways to get at it? Okay, um, yeah, so I, I think I've already talked about this, but in the homework, we're gonna first define groups just on one covariate and then ask you to do weighting. And then we're gonna define groups based on two covariates and then we're gonna give you the population distributions. And then we're gonna ask you to do the marginal distributions as well and then compare. Okay, um, any other questions on that? Okay, so um, what about the first problem? Um, and the first pro so what's the first problem again? The first problem is that your estimate for very specific groups, your estimate for that group might just be bad. And if you do that by just taking the mean response for everyone in that group. But you know, this, this naive method should like intuitively seem wrong to you. Because like intuitively, you're probably wasting a lot of information. And in that the estimate for one group should probably be very similar to an estimate for a neighboring group. So for example, let's say, you know, just as a, a straw person, you have like a sort of 10 covariates and you're, you're you're the group is the intersect of those 10 covariates. And let's suppose one of these covariates is um, whether you live on the south end of Roosevelt Island or the north end of Roosevelt Island. I don't know enough about the geography of Roosevelt Island to know whether that's meaningful. Uh, um, let's suppose that covariate is whether you're wearing a blue shirt today or not a blue shirt today, right? Then the um, sort of presumably, you, like the opinions are not, like the average opinions are not changing that much based on whether you're wearing a blue shirt today. And so you should be able to borrow, like you, sh you should be able to use data on people who are not wearing blue shirts to get your estimate for people who are wearing blue shirts. And this method, um, sort of the naive method doesn't do that, right? It's just saying each of my groups are like completely separate. I'm not gonna borrow any data across from them. Um, there's a very popular method um, called multi-level regression with post stratification. I mean, I think last summer, like one of my jobs was just like run a bunch of these all the time. So like, you know, this is often what's used in practice quite a bit. Um, I'm, today and in the homework, we're gonna do like a baby fake version of multi-level regression, but sort of that's getting at the same idea. So what this method is, is you train some machine learning model to get the estimate y hat for each set of covariates. So in step one, instead of just taking the raw mean for that group, 
you just replace step one with the machine learning model. Um, it's called multi, sort of the first part is called multi-level regression because sort of in, in practice, what's often done is sort of you, um, what's the best way to explain this? Okay, so you first try to get like the mean estimate for the entire population. And then in the same model, you say, let's say the mean estimate for people under 45 and over 45 is going to be somewhat related to the overall population estimate. But then maybe you have some like sort of in the next level, you like split on a on age below 45 and above 45. And then in the next level, you say, okay, so for between 18 to 25, 25 to 34, 35 to 45, each of these somewhat relate to the opinion, the mean opinion for people below 44, below 45, but also you have like special data on that group in particular. So you can do this like multi-level regression thing. You can train it all at once. And the way that happens in practice is for any group that you have a lot of data, right? So let's suppose you have 500 respondents for like one very specific set of covariates. That group is not gonna, sort of that group can be very different from like the overall population average. But for any group in which you don't have a lot of data, this like, sort of approximately uses neighbor, neighboring groups as like if you define neighbors in the right way. And so it trades off being like that that group has a different opinion than any other group and trades off how much data you have for that group. Um, what I'm going to ask you again as a bonus part of the homework to do instead is just train like, like a standard regression model where, for example, you like 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 a baby version of this could be that you know you just convert like a, like age is a covariate that's bucketed between, I forget in the homework whether it's 18 to 35 or 18 to 25, but you know, there's like five buckets or something. Instead of treating that as like, uh, as, um, like discrete covariates, you can treat it as ordered, right? You can convert the first group to a zero, the second group to a one and so on. And then you can run a regression that, so you know, in that way you're gonna borrow some data from 18 to 25 for people between 25 and 35 and vice versa. And so you can, if you define your covariates in the right way and then train a regression model with the appropriate number of interactions and so on, you can like approximate what this method is doing. But sort of, um, I know that was a lot of talking in the air, but sort of just uh, the main idea should be fairly simple is you just plug in, instead of taking the mean, you just plug in a machine learning model here. And then it's called sort of there's sort of the second half of this term, it's called post-stratification, but that's just a fancy term for what all the methods are doing in step two, right? All the methods are weighting across the population. And that's your post, you're stratifying after you have the data, so post-stratification. Um, great question. So the, so the question is, is, um, is there a sort, sort of an amount of regularization for like how much you can borrow across groups? And so, so yes, to, so in practice, there's a, there's a lot of like tuning you have to like sort of, if you're gonna train the full like Bayesian multi-level regression model, there's a lot of tuning on um, sort of exactly what assumptions you use sort of um, in, in Bayesian regression, it's called like sort of what prior you use for how much one group can differ from the population group. And so if, if a group can differ a lot from the population group, you're assuming that sort of, yeah, so, so like that's like one kind of regularization. If you're assuming that the group can't differ a lot from the population group, then it's gonna be exactly what you said is like the mean opinion for that group might drag the population level opinion across. But yeah, so that's, in, in practice, these things are very finicky to train. And there's a lot of assumptions um, on training them, and that's exactly one of them. Any other questions? This is all I'm going to say about this method here. Um, and the homework, I, I mean, I do hope um, some of you, many of you, try out um, sort of the baby version of this that I outlined here.
Any questions? Okay. Yep, so I've already said this. Okay, so I think that's a very quick primer on waiting techniques. Um, so just a few last, or I say parting thoughts, but in the beginning of next time, I'm gonna talk about um, what do you do if you, um, sort of the central assumption here was, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so parting thoughts. So where do the population percentages come from? Um, in political polling, you're gonna need to define a universe of likely voters, or if you're a product and you wanna send out a survey about your product, you need to define the universe of users that you care about, right? Your users today are not necessarily the people you want to be your users five months from now. And so, um, like, you know, a meta step of, pull, of waiting is like just figuring out what is the population that you care about. Um, there's a few methods here that don't exactly match the sort of the two steps that I said um, that I'm not going to cover here. I'm happy to talk about them in like in office hours or elsewhere. Um, I just wanted you all to know the, ner the names, inverse propensity scoring and matching. Um, and then finally, um, note that you can only wait when you observe the covariates for each respondent. Right. So the central assumption throughout today was that conditional on the covariates that you observe, the whether they respond is independent of the response. Um, there's very little you can do if, without that assumption, um, except you can quantify your error. So next time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of trying to, you know, there's not much you can do about your mean estimate, but you can maybe get um, like good intervals, like not, not like confidence intervals in the statistical sense, but you can get um, sort of, like li like ranges for what you think might be reasonable values um, if you don't assume this. Yep, so that's next time. Any questions on waiting? Um, this, this is a big part of the homework. So um, sort of, I, I know we went quickly today, but um, sort of understanding the waiting and being able to implement it in Python is, uh, a considerable part of the homework. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so the question was: is a few slides ago, sort of, um, I said the sort of if you don't have access to the joint distribution. You can, um, you have the ratios that are women, you have the ratios that are um, college educated and so on. And then I, I had ABCD there. And so yes, ABCD just meant you're multiplying the ratio A times the ratio B times C times D. Okay. So um, we ended a bit early today, um, but you know, I have a bunch of announcements. So homework one has been posted. It's due not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna upload instructions for how to turn it in, but it's gonna be turned in on grade scope for those of you who've used that before. Um, we finally have a semi-permanent time for office hours in a room. So my, my office hours are gonna be Wednesdays, so starting today. Um, for now, we're going to try to make it hybrid. So, in, um, so Bloomberg 201 or over Zoom, you can zoom into the room. Um, if that doesn't work very well in the future, we might turn it in. I might turn it into like half the office hours I'll be over Zoom completely, and half them I'll be in person. But for now, we'll try the hybrid thing. Um, Z's office hours are Fridays 1:30 to 2:30. This week, he's going to so he um, he already um, sort of he was really nice. He spent a long time building, uh, sort of writing an introduction to Google Collaboratory, which might be useful for the homeworks, definitely will be useful for the class project. Um, see the introduction is posted on the website, but he's going to spend maybe 15 minutes going over that notebook, answering questions in office hours this week. Um, both of our office hours, we're, we're starting out at one hour a week. Depending on demand, we might add a second hour for each of us. 
and we'll see how that goes. Um, I know a lot of you had questions about enrollment. Uh, we've increased the course capacity to 75. That's still a little bit less than the number of people enrolled plus the wait list. But I'm really hoping sort of in the next few days that everyone who's on the wait list and wants to be the class will be able to take the class. But I don't think I'll be able to increase the course capacity above 75. Um, and then lastly, um, please make sure you have access to Ed STEM and are receiving announcements notifications. So I've probably at this point sent three or four announcements through Ed STEM. You, that should have triggered an email, but you can turn that off if you don't care about emails. But that's going to be the primary way.